Hello and welcome to the Disability Connection. I'm your host, Walter Nunes. The Disability Connection is sponsored by the Disability Law Center. The Disability Law Center is the protection and advocacy system for the Commonwealth, and we're located at 11 Beacon Street. We advocate for the needs of folks with disabilities throughout Massachusetts. And we can be reached uh, on the web at www.dlc-ma.org or toll free 800-872-9992. Today I'm joined by Kristen McCosh. Kristen is the Commissioner of the Mayor's Commission for Persons with Disabilities. Thank you for joining us. You're welcome. So we have a lot to talk about today. Yes. Um, and I think the best way to start is maybe if you told us a little bit about the Commission for Persons with Disabilities, when they were founded, what they do, so on and so forth. Yeah. So um, the commission, Mayor's Commission for Persons with Disabilities is actually a department in City Hall. We're in the Human Services Cabinet, but we also have an advisory board called the um, Disability Commission Advisory Board, uh -huh. which is a volunteer group made up of nine residents who come from different neighborhoods, they have different disabilities, and they're really the public piece of the, um, the program. They are the eyes and ears of the neighborhood. They, inform me of concerns and priorities and then I in turn work on those in my department and help the mayor and his administration focus on priorities and what needs to get done. Now I uh, went to your website which was really informative and I, I and perhaps I wasn't looking at this the right way but there's the commission and then there's the advisory board. Right. Mm -hmm. What's the difference between the two? Well, the commission is what I'm the commissioner of. That's the department in City Hall. So I'm an employee of the city and the advisory board. Um, most departments in City Hall have a separate advisory board mm -hmm. um, just for transparency in government so we're not, we don't become um, like all powerful. Like we really want input from residents and especially under Mayor Walsh, she's committed to transparency in government and input from the public. So he appointed um, three new advisory board members this year. So this is the group of nine residents. We meet once a month in City Hall and we just, um, they're established under a Massachusetts general law, chapter 40, section 8J, mm -hmm. and they're charged with uh, disseminating information to the public, uh, being a resource for people with disabilities, and just helping ensure that government is doing all it needs to do to be accessible. So how many folks are on staff in City Hall? I have seven staff. I have myself, a deputy commissioner, an architectural access specialist, mm -hmm. a program specialist, an outreach specialist, and an information specialist. That's great. And the folks who make up the advisory board, how, how do they get on it? Well, you have to apply. Uh -huh. um, you can apply online. We recently just filled two positions. And um, we're actually working with the state legislature right now to try to expand the advisory board from nine members to 13. I saw that. Yeah. Now, will that, ch will that require a change in the law? It will, and we're working on that. But right now, um, we have more residents applying than we have posts to fill. So we would just love to, um, to be able to represent more neighborhoods and more disabilities. But we have a wide range of disabilities right now, everything from physical to mental health to communication uh, disabilities. So it's a really good representation. You mean the folks on the advisory yep. board? Mm -hmm. Is there a requirement? that the folks on the board have a disability or a family member of a exactly. person? Exactly. Yep. One is um, charged with being a parent of a child with a disability, adult or a young child. And the other ones either have to have a disability or be a relative of someone with a disability. Interesting. So um, I have done the show for quite a few years now and I've had our good friend John Kelly on. And John is a very animated speaker and he often talks about issues related with the city with regards to sidewalks, cobblestones, things of this nature. Okay. Uh, I'm a resident, I'm a lifelong resident of Boston and, and uh, I'm temporarily able as we often refer to ourselves, but the issues of curb cuts is a big, is a big deal. So what are the things that you are presently addressing um, with the commission? Well, interestingly enough, uh, John Kelly was our first uh, advisory board chairperson. Why am I, I not surprised? I know, and he was a great advocate. I just saw him on Monday, actually, and we got a chance to catch up. But he really led the way as far as making uh, Boston more accessible um, for the pedestrians. We, uh, we work, it's probably the biggest part of my job, is making sure that sidewalks, um, curb cuts, uh, street crossings, uh, intersections are all accessible for people with disabilities. And one thing that we do now, the city standard for curb cuts, which um, are the ramps that lead to the corners um, to cross the street, 
they are all installed in concrete with a yellow tactile warning, except for four historic areas, it's concrete with a red tactile warning. But that's a change from uh, material of brick being in the curb cuts or um, a tactile warning that was gray and really wasn't visible to people with low vision. You know, as a, as a city resident, and I live in the Fenway, John lives in the Fenway. Yep. And, um, you know, when there's snow, and we're going to talk a little about, emer about emergency preparedness later, but when there's snow, you know, the mayor and politicians, the police, they always say, get out there and shovel out the hydrant. I've never heard anyone say, get out there and shovel out the curb cut. Well, interestingly, Mayor Walsh did that this year in all his I apologize, messaging. Marty. No, it's true. I was very impressed. Yeah. And that was without prompting for me. Uh, so I think he has that on his radar. But when I was appointed, one of the first things I did was to um, lead the advocacy to update the city's snow removal ordinance because the ordinance just called for clearing sidewalks, a 42-inch wide path of travel, but it didn't include curb cuts. So um, working with the city council, we updated the snow ordinance to include curb cuts. So the way it reads now is that the property owner closest to the corner is responsible for clearing curb cuts. Really? Yes. Because, uh, as you know, we got a lot of snow this year, as we all know. Um, they weren't clear. No, it was, and you know, we got complaints at the beginning of the season, and then as storm after storm hit, we got fewer and fewer complaints, because I think people realized it was impossible for everybody. But we learned a lot this year, so we'll, we always debrief at the end of the season, and we make a plan for next year. I didn't know it was the landlord's responsibility. Yeah. I would have thought you would have had a little cats or little smaller plows. No, the city doesn't do that, but, um, you know, we do have an enforcement team, inspectional services department, so what they'll do is they'll go around and if they see um, violations, they'll give a, a ticket. ticket. And, you know, we try not to, to um, really burden, you know, property owners of, of houses. We, we encourage them to do it. But businesses, certainly, with resources who can hire people to shovel, you know, they're the ones that we really focus on to keep the business areas. You know, I, I don't want to... Uh this topic because there's so much we can talk about but you know um it does bother me because i i you know i grew up uh my father had a disability but uh, by and large you know my sisters and i we, we we didn't we weren't aware of those things but working for the disability law center as long as i have i've become more attuned and mm -hmm. i see cars parked in front of curb cuts yep. and then you see a lot of people who use chairs as you do out in the middle of the street yeah and you go what are they doing in the street but then you realize People get to the end of the sidewalk and they can't get off the right. they can't get off the sidewalk. Right. So, so one thing we're working on right now, just to kind of sum up this piece of it, is we're working on um, a plan for accessible routes across Boston, which will be something like when you go on Google and you can map out a car or a pedestrian yeah. route, you'll be able to eventually um, map out an accessible route, which will show you sidewalks that are compliant with curb cuts to get from point A to point B. So it's something we're really excited about. The Public Works Department just finished a survey of all the sidewalks in the city. So they have width, material, slope, um, all the dimensions that we need. So now we need to work with our ID, IT department to plug it into an app or a program that will be able to map routes. And one last thing about curb cuts, because you mentioned um, neighborhoods. And I know certain neighborhoods have been a little bit difficult to convert or enlighten, shall I yes. say. How are you making out with that? Um, really well. The uh, Public Works Department um, started doing curb ramps in the four historic areas a few years ago, and they were resistant to the concrete and yellow because they wanted to maintain more of a historical character. So we were able to reach a compromise with most of the districts to do concrete with red. We're still working on um, Beacon Hill, but um, it's in the process of... Now, I, I know I said I wasn't going to ask, but what's with the yellow versus the red? Is the yellow just so you can see it? Yep. People with low vision, if you see one that's gray or red, a tactile strip, at night it can look like a puddle, or ah, during the day, you know, ah. with weather, it's really not visible. The yellow is very bright. Would you excuse me? Sorry. I think we have a call. Is that what I being? We do have a call. Caller, welcome to the Disability Connection. Hi, how are you doing? Uh, I have a question for the commissioner. I, I know that Boston's been doing a campaign for Boston 2030, and I was wondering what is, um, what it is to um, it, the goal is to make Boston much more uh, accessible on transportation, whether it's car or boat or rail. I was wondering what are your goals for Boston 2030? I'll take my call up here. All right, thank you. Thank you, Carl. 
Well, under Mayor Walsh, we have a lot of initiatives moving forward. We have Boston 2030, which is a mobility action plan. Like the caller said, it focuses on mobility around the city. We have Boston 2024, which is a housing plan. And um, currently, right now, the BRA is working on a master plan for the city, which hasn't happened since the 1960s. So all of these studies and efforts are really coming together to create the Boston of the future. So under mobility access, um, one thing we would love is to have the city fully accessible for pedestrians, like these accessible routes. Um, the MBTA has come a long way in accessibility. Right now, all of their buses are lowered floor. No more um, mechanical lifts to get on a bus. The only ones that they have now are the ones that are in the backup service. So if a bus breaks down, they use them. But um, they're working on upgrades in all the subway systems. Uh, City Hall Plaza, Government Center Station is undergoing a total renovation that will be completely accessible by 2016. So I think really to have all the public transportation and all the sidewalks accessible is my goal for Boston 2030. That's outstanding. And it's got to be good for the city, right? I mean, it brings in more people to oh, the city, right? Oh, it's great because, um, as we all know, with the census data, um, people are aging. And we want them to be able to age in place to make use of the city. Because in a lot of ways, Boston is really a model community for seniors. I mean, seniors don't have to go relocate to a 55 and older community because with our neighborhoods and our resources, they live in 55 and older communities. So we need to just make sure that the infrastructure is is there for them to use and is accessible. And the linkage is there when the developers build the buildings that they yep. maintain. We work on that a lot. Low too. income, elderly, disabled yep. housing. That's all part of Boston 2024, the housing report. Um, this show always goes faster than I think it's going to go. So I want to I want to talk about some things that I think I know you want to talk about, or at least I'm guessing. And one of them is the 25th anniversary of the ADA. Yes. A momentous year this year. Um, the ADA was passed in 1990, and we're celebrating the 25th anniversary this year on Boston Common on July 22nd. It's going to be an event that's open to all people with disabilities, friends, anyone who wants to just come out and, and have a great day. We're going to have the mayor speak. Um, we're hoping the governor will come. And it's just a chance to really um, welcome young people into mm -hmm, the movement mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and celebrate all the victories that we've had. So I would encourage everybody to come. It's going to be a great day. And what's the date? July 22nd. It's a Wednesday. And it's from 11 to 3 on Boston Common. And we have another call. This is, this is a record. Well, I'm Caller, calling. please. Hello? Yes. Uh, my comment is for the commissioner. I, I realized that she was just speaking about the ADA celebration um, on July 22nd and I was going to ask her what we could expect at that on that day what the event will consist of I don't know if she just went over it all or not uh, because I had to turn my volume down thank you um, I did go over it a little bit but I can also say that um, one really special piece of the day is that we're going to honor what we call ADA pioneers there are so many people in Boston who are disability advocates who are actually there in Washington for the signing. So um, we want to honor them for all their hard work. And now they're sort of passing the torch to the younger generation because it's kind of like any civil rights legislation. We are the generation that fought for it, but young people just grow up with all these rights. So they take it for granted, which is just natural. But we want them to know that we have to keep fighting for our rights because if they don't pick up the torch and fight, we can lose all we've gained. So I think that's going to be a big piece of it. Well, we do see how hard gotten gains are being lost all the time Absolutely. right now. We have a poster in my office which shows some people who use chairs, and one of them has a sign, I can't even get to the back of the bus, it's which I true. always yeah. thought was pretty good. Um, your agency is, has an enabling statute. And I, I was curious, because as you know, I'm an attorney. Do you have uh, police powers? Do you have authority? What, what is the authority of the commission? Well, I am um, the ADA Title II coordinator for the city. So that's um, mandated by ADA. So that's the biggest legal authority that we have. Now, that being said, we don't have enforcement powers. We do have, uh, we work on compliance. The only ones with enforcement powers of the ADA is the federal government, either the Department of Justice for most titles or the EEOC with mm -hmm. uh, employment titles. So um, what the process is, is if someone feels like they're being discriminated against by the city in a program or in a physical um, access issue, they can file a grievance procedure with me. So 
under the law, I would be the first step in resolving a grievance. Mm -hmm. But if it doesn't get resolved with me, they can go to someone like the Disability Law Center or the Mass Commission Against Discrimination, and they can take it to a federal level. But they are the only ones with police power. So you have uh, you you try to resolve things informally. Absolutely. Yeah. So you work with, let's say, if it's a landlord thing, yep. you try to set up mediation or something of that yep. nature. Um, we don't do individual case management just because we don't have the staff. But we, I do individual cases when it comes to city responsibilities. So anything within the city of Boston, I would take on personally and try to resolve. Fantastic. One of the things I noticed in talking about events, I've, I, you know, I've gotten so much information, I know we're not going to get to it all. But one of the things I thought was really interesting was the film festival. Now, has that already happened, or is that ongoing? Or Yeah, well, there's a, a national film festival called Real Abilities, R-E-E-L, -E that. That, that focuses on disability films. Um, that happens in the winter, February, I think, every year. And so we collaborate with that. But we also have a monthly film series that we work on with the Cambridge Disability Commission. It's called uh, Disability Reframed. So mm -hmm. you can check that on our website. Um, it's a great event. It's free. We always show a film, and then we have someone who's involved with the particular topic of the film, um, whether it's mental health or physical disability, uh, lead a discussion afterwards with the community. So what is your website so that folks can okay. locate it? It's City of Boston. I'm um, sorry. Yep, cityofboston.gov slash disability. And are any films coming up, and would you know offhand where they might be uh, they, al they alternate between Boston and Cambridge. We just had one shown at Boston University a few weeks ago. Nice. So we haven't scheduled the next one yet, but check our website for updates. Terrific. And is there a number that people could call? Like I noticed, and I'm jumping around, so please forgive me, but um, you have these meetings, the advisory board meetings, the, the last Thursday the of the month, Thursday the fourth Thursday of the Thursday month. Of the Sometimes month. there are five at 5.30 in City Hall. Now, if somebody wanted to go to that, do they just show up? Do they have yep. to call ahead? No, absolutely just show up. If they need an accommodation, please call ahead. I read ahead. my mind. Yep. Uh, we do have ASL at every um, meeting because we have a board member who's deaf and uses ASL. Um, I'm delighted to say we have another call. You're a huh? very popular person, <laughs> Commissioner. Great. Caller, what is your question? Uh, my question is, I attended uh, a, f a forum, a disability forum at Suffolk University on Monday that was open to the public, and I was wondering how often you have them, those meetings in that kind of a venue. Yes, this Monday we had uh, our community forum on disability issues. We have that once a year, and I actually started that when I was appointed five years ago by Mayor Menino because um, I just feel like residents of the city really need to have a voice in city government you know we work for the people you know i i don't work you know for the government i work to make government accessible to people so the forum is a great way for people to come out and tell me what their priorities are tell me what i need to work on we got some great feedback and i also reported back to the community on the things that i worked on over the past year and so i have that report up on my website um, which you can check again at uh, www.cityofboston gov slash disability. It's an annual report from 2014 and also the advisory board has their annual report posted just to see what the issues we worked on and all the accomplishments that we've gained. Um, we've got about five, four or five minutes left. Um, what are some of the issues that people bring to your attention? I'd be curious about that. Well, you know, this year a lot of the issues focused on the MBTA, which kind of let me off the hook a little bit because I don't directly <laughs> oversee the uh, MBTA. But um, the MBTA is doing a fantastic job. It's just that a lot of times, um, things like I talk about with the city infrastructure, it takes years of planning and bidding to actually see results. So people sometimes get frustrated when they, they make these complaints and then it doesn't happen instantly. Yeah. So tough year for the T. Oh, really tough. Um, and because of the snow, and that kind of leads me to what I think will probably be our last main topic. It's of concern to my office. Uh, a lot of this uh, came to the fore after Katrina, ideas of emergency preparedness generally, but emergency preparedness for folks with disabilities. I know you have it up, some things up on your website. Would you like to talk a little bit about what it is and how folks can prepare yeah. themselves? 
Sure. So we have um, what we call the OEM, the Office of Emergency Management, and they have a control center uh, in town. So when anything happens, like the uh, marathon bombing, that's um, immediately staffed, and um, they work, you know, until the events are over. But they also work constantly on things like storms. They issue warnings, um, like we got warnings the last few days about flash floods. Right. And then I, in turn, do outreach to my constituents to let them know about any issues that are happening. But in addition to that, we do um, things like um, disability is a piece of all their planning, things like for sheltering. They just did an, an assessment of all the city's emergency shelters mm -hmm. to plan for accessibility and needs of people with disabilities, whether they need certain nutrition items or things like training on guide dogs, because a lot of people consider guide dogs pets, and we have to you know, educate them that they're not pets, that they're a necessity. Well, we have a sister organization in New Orleans, and um, lack of preparedness about pets was huge. Oh, I believe it. One of the things that I noticed, you call it a go bag. What's a go bag? Yep. Well, for people with disabilities, it's critical because you may be there for days and not have access to medicine mm -hmm. or medical supplies. Uh, people who take insulin or, um, you know, people who need certain items with them. So that should always be in your go bag. And we have a link on our website to the emergency management office that can list uh, detailed instructions for that. I mean, we all know about emergency preparedness to an extent. And, you know, for us temporarily able, they talk about flashlights and batteries and wind up radios and stuff. Right. But the specific needs of folks with disabilities are unique. They really are. One thing that what I would be stuck without is a battery charger because I use an electric chair, a power wheelchair. So um, these are things that I give input on in the planning for emergency sheltering to have battery chargers in place and being able to acquire them. Another thing is if people sleep on cots, um, sometimes people with disabilities have to get dressed laying down so to have privacy screens mm -hmm. so that they're just not out in the middle of the floor having to try to get dressed and do care in bed in front of you know, yep. potentially hundreds of people. This just popped into my head, as things often do. Um, does the city know where folks are? For example, like if there was an emergency, um, being able to outreach to people to rescue, if you will, or get people to shelter who may not be mobile, who may not have a charger, the yep. power's out. Does the city, I mean, I don't, it's a privacy issue, I'm sure, but is there a way that the city knows where folks are so they can outreach to folks and help them? Um, we're working on right now what's called a functional needs registry. It will be, a lot of cities have them. It's a volunteer registry where people can go into the website and sign up and let us know about their needs in cases of emergency. It's not in place right now, but what is in place is we work with NSTAR and the other utilities so that if there's a power outage happening, people who are on a vent um, and need a ventilator to breathe, right. they'll, they know where all those people are. And if, they, if you are on a vent or you know a family member who is and you're not registered with the city, please contact me and we can get you linked up with NSTAR. So we have to wrap it up, Commissioner. You have been an outstanding guest, the, certainly the most popular. Three <laughs> calls is an all-time record. Uh, I encourage people to go to the website for the Disability Commission uh, about all of the wonderful things that they do and the events and also things like emergency preparedness. Um, my name is Walter Nunes. would like to tell you that in addition to this broadcast, this show will be shown several times uh, over the course of the next eight weeks or so, but it also will be available on YouTube and Vimeo and Facebook and on the Disability Law Center's webpage. So thank you very much, Commissioner. It was a great show. Great. Easy peasy, great huh? Thank you. You're entirely welcome.